so far so <laughs> <laughs> I think what I'm gonna do is basically get them landing and then yeah then I tell it I'm gonna try to get yeah the uh, like our point of contact that they gave me like four in the morning goes straight to voicemail every time so <laughs> do you know who it is it like a film school or something yeah the principal John Carla I've asked a few people if they could direct me. Like, oh, good luck. <laughs> How long have you been? It's been good. All of them. Have you been in Knoxville? Oh, no, uh, yeah, a little bit. I moved here in September last year. And oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. From Pennsylvania. Oh, from New Jersey. Oh, nice. Yeah. What part? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It's honestly, I mean, it's not a lot of money. Yeah. Bye. Or less. Bird just left Bearden. And a good day, it's only three minutes.
what are you, are you doing? I'm the freshman academy. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah, we, we all have five. Okay. This is my first time. I, I moved to Knoxville in September, so. Okay. Kind of, that's why I went in. I went in through the wrong entrance. Yeah, was, <laughs> I just let the officer get down there. Yeah. I hope they. Yeah. I gotta grind it out. I appreciate you working. Watch out. So they're and then they're gonna land where that cone is. Okay. If you want to like watch them land, watch them land. You may want to get on the ground yeah. there. Then we have to run. That's true. We're trying to figure out how to get her from here. To Actually, no. I'll it's go down. Take, it's gonna take them. It is. So okay. we are being told that they're going to kill the, the blades. Okay. So that's in two, three minutes. Okay. They'll stop. I would think and then maybe we can get to the top. Unloaded. Yeah. Okay. Right here. All right. Do you want me to grab Is this yours? Yeah, that's mine. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> get a good shot. All right. Sorry. <laughs>
Students, uh, welcome. Welcome. Let's give uh, ROTC a hand. Uh, I'd like to also welcome, we have ROTC from seven, diff seven different schools here. Welcome to Farragut High School. As I told some of you yesterday, I got to meet uh, some heroes, and two of them are in front of you in front of you today. Before I turn it over to Heather Haley for as she is the MC for our event, I do need to recognize a few people here today. Uh, some of our town uh, aldermen and mayor, uh, our county commissioner, and uh, some of our representatives. So let's do that real quick. Alderman Drew Burnett, Vice Mayor Louise Pavlin. Mayor Ron Williams, Town of Farragut Town Manager David Smoke, uh, County Commissioner John Shoemaker, State Rep Jason Zachary, State Senator uh, Becky Duncan Massey, and then State Senator Senator Briggs. Welcome uh, to Farragut High School. I don't want to steal anybody's thunder or get into their story. Uh, it is the honor of a lifetime to share a stage 
with two Medal of Honor winners. This is the highest, the highest decoration um, award given to anybody in our nation for their bravery on the battlefield. I, I said earlier to you that so far it's just been men. I am positive the first woman Medal of Honor winner is coming. And, and it will be, if you will notice, it will be men of all color, races, coming from all parts of our country uh, that have earned this, this award, received, they received this award. Uh, once again, I want to turn over to Heather Haley from WVLT, as she's the honor, um, she's the MC for the event. And uh, guys, please pay attention. What you learned today, uh, put it in your heart. Keep it. Hold it precious. Uh, because it will guide you the rest of your life. Heather. Good morning. As you mentioned, I'm Heather Haley. Actually, it's kind of cool. I'm back on the stage. Last time I was on this stage was when we were doing Cinderella in musical theater class here at Farragut. So it's a little different. The, the lights aren't as bright right now. But honestly, it's an even, even better story to tell today. Um, we've actually had the honor of telling all sorts of stories on WVLT about the Medal of Honor recipients. I think the most fascinating part to me was when I learned that they were not obeying orders. Can you imagine how Dr. Bartlett would react if you were disobeying what you're supposed to do? You were not likely to get an, a, an award for it, a medal for it, right? But this is a special kind of situation. So they went above and beyond against what they were supposed to do, expected to do, to do some amazing and extraordinary things. So the stories you hear today really are almost mind blowing. I'll admit, I'll probably will tear up. I'm one of those people. Um, but I think this is a fabulous opportunity to just kind of listen and absorb like Dr. Bartlett said. They have so many amazing tips, even that can apply to so many facets of our lives. Sorry, there's three different microphones here. I don't mean to ping them all on you. But I want to give them the opportunity to tell their story. So we're actually going to start with Michael Fitzmorris. Uh, now, when he earned the Medal of Honor, he was a specialist fourth class. He went on to actually earn his highest rank of tech technical sergeant in the Air National Guard. He earned this award during the Vietnam War. Um, in 1971. So I want to give him the opportunity to go ahead and speak. Would you have to come up here? Or you want me to come to you? Good morning, everybody. What, what a great day. Gary and I get to spend time with you. And then we they threw in a helicopter ride, which is always a great way to start the day. Sixty years ago, probably Gary and I were both sitting right where you guys are, wondering what we were going to do with our lives. I knew I didn't want to go to college, so I went and joined the, the military, in the Army actually. Went to Vietnam in 70, 71. And now it's your turn. You guys are going to be the future. and. We want our country back, so get in there and get her done. <laughs> I don't know what. No. Well, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot then. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Whatever you're willing to share for that day. What was the, the moment, the experience that you had that brought you this? May I go back? <laughs> Sorry about that, I, I don't do this very often. Well, it was 1971. I had just turned 21, and two weeks later they blew me up. So I, we was, I only had like two months left in country, and they said we're going up to Quezon, that's, they were going into Laos at the end of the, and, they said, it's good duty, you're just going to guard the airstrip. So here I am, I went out on, on guard duty. I think we got done about, about 2 in the morning. I trucked back to our, our bunker where we slept. I think there was probably four to six guys in there. 
And I no more got in than the, the rockets and mortars and stuff started coming in, so I was already dressed, and my buddy Phil, I think he was next on guard, so we, we ran out to the fighting home. When I came out the door, if it wouldn't have been for Phil, I wouldn't even be here because there was five sappers and he shot them up and we got to our, our bunker. And then, from then, I don't know, they said, a, I don't know how, how many is in a company? About 300. That's what they said there was, a company of sappers. And you have to understand these guys there, well, I guess actually almost what you'd call suicide bombers nowadays, but they were highly trained and we had the wire and, and they slithered under. So all the time I was on guard duty, they must have been coming under, under the wire. And then they come in and they, the few that come under there blow the wire and the rest of them can run in. So we're in the fighting hall fighting and I seen a guy come up, up the, we were in trenches, they're all connected together, about neck high, so I look out and here come somebody up this trench, I thought, well, that's got to be one of ours, and about that time he throws a grenade in. I threw two out and then the, the third one I couldn't get, so I just covered him up and, and then just kept on going. I got banged up pretty good. But in the end, we all came out okay. Phil was with me. He got wounded. I got wounded. And the, the guys in the bunker, they threw a charge in there and buried them. And I got medevac. Phil got medevac. And so for 30 years, we didn't know. I didn't know if Phil was alive, or he didn't know if I was, and we didn't know about the guys in the bunker. So we finally had a a second of 17 Cav reunion, and we got there, and here's Phil and Bill, and Billy. I guess Phil received a Purple Heart in Vietnam and he, he threw it in the trash can. But Billy had picked it up and he kept it for 30 years and gave it back to him at this reunion. And then, I don't know, I think it was uh, probably eight, 10 years ago now, Billy committed suicide and my buddy Phil had a freak accident, cut himself, and got gangrene, and he died. So I'm the only musketeer left. But thank you for listening. grenades and he's just jumping right in. I don't think that would be my reaction to be completely honest. Definitely braver than I. Um, I was talking to Gary Luttrell before this and you know he, I think he's got some great points too that are going to help us all realize what we can learn from the Medal of Honor. Obviously you don't, obviously we have some awesome students that are hopefully will be future members of our military up top right now with uh, seven different schools represented here from ROTC that's fabulous. I'm sure you guys are taking in different lessons than maybe I would, maybe the other students here would, but there's something in it for everybody. Um, so I want to turn it over to Gary Luttrell, also served in the Vietnam War, was Sergeant First Class in the Army when he received the Medal of Honor and earned the highest rank of Command Sergeant Major. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your story, sir, but I know that you have some really wonderful lessons, the points of the Medal of Honor that you would like to share with us all. Thank you, 
Mikey forgot to say, so I will. Uh, Mikey and I received our awards at the same time. Uh, we received our award for President Nixon. And for you people on or about my age, a little bit younger, you know, our award was in between Watergate and Goodbye. And Nixon had more, more fish to fry that day than Mikey and I. You know, he come in, presented our award, shook our hand, muttered something, out the door he went. A couple weeks later, he was even waving goodbye on the helicopter. So it was exciting to find out that I got to meet President Nixon before he, before he took off. I'm going to make my story real, real short. Uh, if you want to know more about my action, just, just Google CSM for Special Command Sergeant Major Jerry Luttrell, and you can read my citation. But I'll give you a short version of it, because actually it's a boring citation. I, uh, I, got, uh, I got orders to take my Vietnamese radio today, and I was an advisor of the American unit. I was an advisor of the Vietnamese radio today. And we had another, which is now another law recipient who passed away was that a special forces space camp that got overrun, and most of them were dead or wounded. Uh, Gary Bakker was uh, the medic in that camp. He received the Medal of Honor for the action also. But they were overrun, and I had a, I was advisor to the Vietnamese Army today, which consisted of 473 Vietnamese Rangers, and I had four advisors. So we were going to, uh, our mission was to penetrate uh, their compound that had been overrun, set up a defensive uh, position, and get the dead and wounded evacuated. I got one hill off short, and uh, darkness caused us, and uh, we didn't move in Vietnam that night. And the enemy that was attacking the area was consisted of roughly 5,000 North Vietnamese uh, hardcore fighters. 66 NBA Regiment, the 29th NBA Regiment, and the K-6 Battle Battalion. And they just threw a horseshoe around my, my hill. And uh, I had artillery, I had air support. So we beat them down. It took us four days and four nights. At the end of that four days and four nights, I uh, out of the 473 Vietnamese, I had 41 walking with the left. And out of the four fighters, it was me. And the ones that uh, survived uh, thought that during those four days I, I went above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, I didn't. I was doing my job. I was a sergeant for the class. And uh, you know, I was just doing my job. But I was awarded the Medal of Honor for it. So, but if you want to read the citation, just Google Gary Israel and you can read it. Now, I want to talk to you about you. Your character development. Who are you? And that's a question I want you to ask yourself. I want all of you today to look in the mirror and ask the question Who am I? Who am I? Am I a person of character? And let's talk about the six core values of the Medal of Honor and how you can apply that to you. Those six core values, courage, commitment, sacrifice, and the most important word in the English language, integrity, citizenship, and patriotism. Those are the core values of the Medal of Honor. But each of you can apply these four values to your life every day. So let's talk a little bit about those. Let's take the first courage. You know, you look at courage and say, okay, that's a soldier, a sailor, uh, a, a Gary Lefell, a Michael Fitzmaurice that went into combat and done heroic things. No, no. Courage. Courage to you is doing the right thing under adverse conditions. It might not be popular, but it's the right thing to do. 
And you know what the easy way out? You do the right thing under adverse conditions. And let's take an example of that. Stand up to a bully. You see someone being bullied, and you walk up to that person. The only thing you can do with it without worrying about being beat up is the approach you take. But when you have the courage to walk up to that bully and to say, Excuse me, why are you bullying this person? Would you feel better giving someone a helping hand, someone less fortunate than you? Give them a hand up and sit in the Lord again. Now that takes courage, doesn't it? But that's who you are. I want you to look in the mirror and ask yourself, who am I? Am I a person of courage? Can I do the right thing in your adverse condition? You know, you often wonder, how are you perceived by the person in your life you love? How are you perceived by your parents and your teachers and your congregation? Most important of all, you look in that mirror, how are you perceived by that image you look at you? That's important. That's important. You on this earth for a very short time. Be honorable. Be courageous. Do the right thing. Commitment. If you commit to something, as soon as times get a little difficult, don't say, oh, I quit. I quit. No, be committed. You go and fulfill your mission. Let me give you an example of that. Okay? How many people love football? Everybody loves football, right? Let's take that right guy. Right guard. Yeah, he loves football. He's better than big as he is. Big enough to go bring his hair out for the little bit. But, but you know, let's take that right time and right time. What's their job? Their job is to protect that quarterback, right? Protect that quarterback. We got two minutes left in the game. But are we going to quit? If we quit, if that right time or right time, if they quit, I pour my picture. Be committed. Go all the way. If you say, I'm going to do it, sacrifice. Sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice your comfort for those less fortunate than you? Look at the mirror. That's just who I am. Now I'm going to talk about the most important word in your English language. To me, it is. And I think it should be to you. The word integrity. Without integrity, ladies and gentlemen, you are a body without a soul. Without integrity. And what is that? You don't lie, you don't steal, and you don't cheat. Look in the mirror. Who am I? Am I a liar? Am I a thief? Do I cheat? How do you want me to see you like yourself? You know the first time you tell a lie is difficult. Second time you tell a lie, it's easier. Third time you tell a lie, it becomes second nature. Pretty soon, what are you? A lie. How are you perceived by the person to your right and left? He's a lie. You can't believe the word says. Can you take something that doesn't belong to you? You know how you can test a feeling? What do you do when nobody's looking? Huh? Think about that. Nobody's looking. Oh, look at your hair like that. Nobody's looking. I'm going to stick that in the pocket. Well, guess what? 
Look at the mirror. What clothes do I have? She said, A beam. A scheme. It's real easy to understand from my grandkids now. It's real easy to cheat. They're just a computer image. Okay? Is cheating easy? You think about it. Who are you cheating? Are you cheating the person you're on the left? Are you cheating your teachers? Your parents? No. If you cheat, who are you cheating? You're cheating yourself. Look in the mirror. What looks like at you? A cheater. Character. Start building your character now at an early age. At an early age. I didn't start until I was 19 years old. Or excuse me, 17 years old. There was a day I had one year I come from a very, very dysfunctional family. I didn't have any parental guidance at all. My first parental guidance was from my Venezuela, who shined and pulled his boot with my butt. <laughs> that was the parental guidance that I had. But I realized. I was going to be a leader of troops. And I recall that on the six foundations of the moment. Courage, commitment, sacrifice, integrity, citizenship, and patriotism. Each of you look in the mirror today. Look in the mirror. Next time you go to the red paper, look in the mirror. Up there, reach from the front over here, and then 
and most of my family had served. So here's where I got the harebrained idea. I'm going to go join the military. Myself and three classmates went down, signed up, and when I got home, my dad was mad. <laughs> <laughs> but it all worked out. I joined the war of Vietnam. I was uh, a Sergeant B-5 before I heard the war. But as I said earlier, I come from a very dysfunctional family. One of the first things that I can remember as a child, I think I was, I was four years old, was my dad and uncle getting into a knife fight, and my dad led all over the house, the front yard, and fell out of the ditch. You know, and I'm a little kid, and I'm looking down, and fell out of the ditch. The second thing I can remember, I was five years old, and I was looking down into the coffin of my dead mother and her brother that had gotten her over by a car. Sorry, Rascal wasn't there to take care of us. Uh, I lived with various uh, family members uh, off and on, and never, uh, never felt that I was I was warm. Okay, I, I can't remember as a child uh, receiving a hug or, or or someone telling me I love you, and I missed that. Okay, I was nine years old when my uncle took me down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And I watched the first ever one of the jump out of airplanes. I had no idea if he could jump out of airplanes. Okay? But I looked up and seen those paratroopers and I said, that has got to be me. I am going to join the Army as quick as I can. And I'm going to be a paratrooper and I'm going to find out who I am and start building this character. Okay? And so I was 15 years old. Right before my 15th birthday, I was uh, living with my uncle, and I heard him and my brother saying, well, you know, somebody else is going to have to come and get him. We don't want him anymore. And I was a little 14, almost 15 years old. I said, that's crushing shit. You know? And I said, you know what? I don't need these people. You know, they can kiss the bottom, bottom of my foot. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm out of here. So the next morning, I started hitchhiking from Kentucky to California. And I ended up, my last ride ended up in El Monte, California, close to LA. And I said, the only thing I had, only thing I owned was a birth certificate that my grandmother gave me. I had a wallet with a birth certificate and she didn't have any money in it, but I had my birth certificate. I said, I get out to California, nobody knows me. I got my first step in, I tell you I did. The part B is you're two from Korea. Uh, it's 19 from Afghanistan and Iraq, including the license of Cody Meyer, Kyle Carpenter, Ty Carter, and some of our newest Melbourne Army members. Talk about what the Melbourne Army means to you, and as you sit in the room, uh, with all the other Medal of Honor winners, uh, what comes to mind? Well, I, is that a box number? It's off. It's off. It's off. <coughs> Excuse me. When I was in basic training, we went to a museum, and, and there was a, a Medal of Honor, and God, we all, ooh, we're going to get one of those someday. And, and then, as luck would have it, I did, and I was out, I actually was out of the military, I, two years, I went back to the passing house where I worked, and was sawing up pigs one day, and they called up and said, you got to call the office, so I went down, and I thought, oh man, I'm going to be in trouble here, but here it was the White House, said, and I would be receiving the medal, 
and I didn't really know really that much about it. And I thought, yeah, nah, that's going to be all right. But the more you, you look into it, you, you see the, the people sacrifice of, for so many years. And in my own case, I, I never figured on surviving it, so really it is a not an eye down it. But now to be with the other recipients, we're, we're kind of like a big family, and we don't talk about war stories and his grandkids and <laughs> what you in your life, and it's just great. Different than uh, Mike and Mike, we uh, go back to Vietnam and look back in just a living life. I say I'm not to do And that, that was difficult because I realized early as a Medal of Honor recipient that all eyes are on me. I have to be perfect 24 7 to live up to the Medal. And that was a challenge. It was a challenge. I had to say it every day. There was nothing that I was saying. You know, you hear your Now, what's it like to go to conventions? Like Mike said, we don't know war stories. I don't want to listen to his war story. He don't want to listen to mine. I don't care less what he does. <laughs> I don't want to listen about Patty. I don't want to listen about that grandbaby. That's what we you know, we grew up together. I've known Mikey for 50 years. That, we grew up. Mikey is my brother. The 33 recipients, I believe it's 33, that's here at this convention are my brothers, okay? The brothers that I never had. We look out for each other. We take care of each other. I get a hunting trip in Colorado. Who do I call? Hey, Mikey, you want to go out hunting in Colorado with me? Got two slots. Okay? I get a hunting trip. I love the hunt, okay? I love the hunting trip. You know? I get a hunting trip in Africa. I call Bob Patterson. Hey, Bob. We're going to go to Africa and go hunting with it. Back to us. That's, that's what it's like to be a member of our system. We look out for each other. And if we know that one of them is financially hurt, there's a crisis in their life, they need assistance, we are the first to step up and give assistance to that fellow member. I thought I'm going to want to That's a good question. Thank you. I've never had that question. We have uh, about nine minutes. So if you have a question, if you have questions, come on. You got a hell of a speech, you're not much of a nice. If you have questions, come on down. We we got these questions. We're good. Just a few. We've got nine minutes, guys, before I can get that moving, okay? I want to speak from the group. There were a group of nine of us. The 
got our medals together. Uh, because President Nixon finally accumulated them over two to three years ago. <laughs> and it presented them all at one time. We won't go back. That's so, no politics. Okay. Um, but then I, I do want to see for some from that group of nine. Okay, I'll make this quick because I won't get as many questions as possible. Uh, there were three of us, and I'll use three. We come back. I, I say I'm back to duty. We're about to be in soldiers, we're training soldiers. We had one in a case, and you can uh, Google him if you want, but not right now. We will be later. Kenneth Case, K A Y S. To the best of my knowledge, the only recipient to receive the medal is the Indian brother. Kenneth couldn't wear the medal. He couldn't live with it. Kenneth hung himself the rope. Gary Bacher, one of my closest friends, he passed away this past December. Gary from my tried to go to college. It was impossible the way we found better than three back then. He literally moved up New York, up in New York, lived in a cave for several years until he met his little wife when he went to make his grocery run one Saturday and she convinced him to, to uh, come out of the cave. It was difficult, not only being a Medal of Honor recipient coming back from a war, but the Vietnam War was an unpopular war, and it was difficult to come home. I hope that answers your question. You have a similar question. Yeah. Um, regarding the unpopular war, um, how was it trying to find a new job or like a new career during that time? Was there trouble trying to uh, get accepted or? In the passing house that I worked in, I, I worked there all through high school at night unloading salt trucks. And so then I got into the main plant while I was in high school. And you got what they called rice. So if you had so many months in, I left and you come back and you were guaranteed the same job that you had. But then these folks, once they found I was Vietnam veteran, they were always, you know, bang and stuff, and I'd go nuts. And so it's, it's how it is. Well, I started going back to duty, so I didn't have to adjust. And by the time I retired, the unpopular war was over, the popular war was on, okay? And I had people say, hey, thank you for your service, okay? Um, I, uh, I, I stayed on my duty, lived on the base, so I didn't have to put up with those clever murders that I used to call them names, but now I say people that had to use differently now. See how I've changed in life? <laughs> Another guy, okay, had one little incident at a family reunion from one of my little war protesting cousins, and, you know, he positioned himself right across from me at, the, at dinner and made a couple of nasty comments, so I had to teach him how to breathe through his ear and call his face, face down in the mashed potatoes. And it wasn't having no problem after that. We've got, we've got about three minutes, we've got about three minutes and I've got rapid fire questions real quick. What was your favorite food while you were in the Your favorite food? <laughs> Whatever they fucking from. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was an advisor, and I ate off the economy. Well, I, I love the Indian food. Uh, first, on behalf of all the ROTC here, I'd like to say thank you for your service. Um, if you had to go back and do it all again under the same circumstances, would you? Certainly would. No doubt. If I had to do it all over again, I'd make a couple of modifications. I might have zigged when I should have back. <laughs> when y'all wanted to join the military, did y'all ever think that you would make it this far? Repeat that. But when you joined the military, did you ever think you'd make it this far? Did you ever have determination, hey, this is what your future holds? No, nope, I had no idea where it was going. I, I'm just, I was in pretty good shape, so basic wasn't bad, and that's all I worried about is getting through. <laughs> I think once I realized that I could be another 
Coach Archer's Collier. I could be that NCO that was highly respected. Uh, I, I knew what I was going to be. My little vision was going to be good. My life was going to be good. Okay, the next one is actually about your military occupation. So, if, those of you that don't know, when you go to the military, you choose a field, you choose an occupation, a specialist, whether whatever that is. And so, the next one is about that. Did you enjoy the occupation? Your, your occupational field, your MOS? I was, I don't want the numbers anymore, but I was trained in Army Recon. When I got to Vietnam, the 101st had walked in an ambush and lost a bunch of guys so they kicked us, and I was helicopter assault, or whatever they called it then. I was, a, I was an instrument, and then I specialized later on as a big sergeant as, a, as an airborne ranger. I promise this to my students, I'm going to give you guys like 30 seconds, I know this is a big deal, get your phone down and take a picture. Okay, right, more commanding than I can be. Would you help me with my kids sometime? No, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Just curious. I'm going to try that at home. I bet it didn't work. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I think you guys had some fabulous questions. I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I think I'm going to take a lot away from that. So thank you very much for sharing everything with us today. Thank you guys for being such wonderful examples of what Farragut can do and be. Again, I'm proud to call this my, my past high school as well. Thank you guys. Gentlemen, we have a couple hats. We actually have to have what we do. Thank you. Real! I can't hurt! Gentlemen. Students have a seat.